Madam President. The Republican Whip. Madam President, I too want to uh, acknowledge the great work of the Senator from Tennessee, Senator Haggerty, uh, on this uh, matter on which we'll be voting later this afternoon. And that has to do with the issue of DC crime. And uh, I think he has um, uh, touched a nerve uh, in a way that uh, I think is going to lead to a very big bipartisan outcome on this because it's a, a recognition that uh, the issue that uh, he addresses with this resolution is one that um, the American people, I think, feel deeply about, uh, one that is affecting our cities, both large and small, all across this country, and one on which I think this uh, United States Senate needs to be heard. Madam President, on the last weekend in February, eight men were fatally shot in Washington, D.C. Eight men on a single weekend. It was a tragic illustration of the current crime situation in our nation's capital. Homicides in Washington, D.C., which had already reached disturbing heights in 21 and 22, are up 33 percent so far this year compared to this point a year ago. Now, we're just 20, or I should say, we're just 67 days into 2023, but so far this year, there have been 101 carjackings, and that's a motor vehicle theft where the victim is actually present. 66 percent of those involving guns. There have been a staggering 1,258 motor vehicle theft thefts to date this year. 1,200 and 58. That's an average of roughly 19 motor vehicle thefts every single day. 19 thefts every day. Madam President, in the face of the crime surge D.C. has been experiencing for a while now, the D.C. City Council recently decided to pass legislation weakening penalties for a number of crimes. The bill the Council passed late last year would reduce the maximum penalty for crimes like carjacking, robbery, and firearm offenses, remove mandatory minimum sentences for all crimes except first-degree murder, clog up the court system by substantially expanding access to trial by jury to individuals charged with misdemeanors, and more. Madam President, later today we will be taking up legislation here in the United States Senate to block the bill. Congress, of course, has the legal authority to block D.C. ordinances thanks to federal legislation rooted in the Constitution which gives Congress legislative jurisdiction over the seat of the U.S. government, namely Washington, D.C. And it looks like today's vote will receive strong support from both parties. Now, Madam President, that certainly was not looking like it would have been the case a week ago. Last month, the Biden administration issued a statement opposing the move to block D.C.'s crime bill. When the House took up the measure, 82% of House Democrats voted against blocking the D.C. bill. But last week, the President changed his tune. He announced that he would not veto the attempt to block the D.C. bill. And since then, Senate Democrats have been lining up to announce that they will vote to block D.C.'s measure. Madam President, I'm pleased that Democrats have recognized that weakening criminal penalties is not the way to address D.C.'s crime surge. Blocking D.C.'s crime bill will be a victory for common sense and for the people of D.C. who deserve a safe city in which to live. But while I'm pleased at the expected outcome of today's vote, I remain deeply concerned about how we got here in the first place. How have we gotten to the point where some people think that an appropriate response, appropriate response to a surge in crime is to weaken criminal penalties? to a point where ideology has overtaken common sense to the detriment of public safety. Well, I think part of the answer lies in the deeply troubling surge in anti-law enforcement rhetoric over the past few years and the accommodation of it by members of the Democrat Party. There's been talk of defunding our most essential public servants, the police. Characterization of our justice system is fundamentally unjust. An attitude that the answer to crime is not to try to stop it from taking place, but to stop punishing criminals. And the Democrat Party has been deeply complicit in this. One leading Democrat senator and Democrat presidential candidate had this to say a few years ago, and I quote, let's just start with the hard truth about our criminal justice system. It's racist. It is. And when I say our system, 
I mean all the way. I mean front to back, end quote. That from a leading Democrat senator and Democrat presidential candidate. And she's not the only prominent Democrat who's spoken that way. Many other Democrats, of course, have not been that explicit. But they've tried to have it both ways, attempting to say they support the police on one hand while also accommodating the radical elements of their party that want to tear down our justice system and demonize not just a few bad police officers, but a whole community of public servants who put their lives on the line for us every single day. President Biden is a striking example of this. As his about face on the D.C. crime bill makes clear, he's eager to portray himself as a supporter of law and order, especially, I assume, given that polling has made it clear that Americans are deeply concerned about crime. But at the same time that he's trying to portray himself as anti-crime, he is nominating individuals to serve in his administration who have engaged in anti-police rhetoric. The president can't have it both ways. And his attempt, and Democrats' attempt to do so, has helped a troubling anti-law enforcement, anti-justice system narrative to gain hold in our communities. Madam President, one thing I always think about when I hear anti-law enforcement rhetoric is how little attention is paid to the victim. People speak negatively about criminal penalties or over-policing, but they don't talk about the victims of violent crimes and what it's like to live in a place where you fear, where you literally fear for your safety. As D.C.'s mayor recently said, and I quote, we have to think about victims of crime as much as we think about perpetrators, end quote. And I would argue more than we think about perpetrators. But too often the focus of discussions is almost entirely on perpetrators, with little attention paid to the victims of crime or the consequences of tolerating criminal activity. As the D.C. police chief recently said of D.C.'s bill, and I quote, where's the victim in all of this? Who does this actually help? Is the victim being helped, or is it the person who victimizes? I don't think victims win in that space. And again, that's a non-starter for me, end quote. That, Madam President, from the D.C. police chief speaking of the very bill that we're going to block today. Madam President, bills like the D.C. City Council's bill should be a non-starter for everyone. And Democrat politicians need to stop accommodating the kind of ideology that thinks reducing criminal penalties is an appropriate response to crime. I'm thankful, as I said, for the senator from Tennessee's leadership, and that later today we're going to vote to block legislation that would endanger D.C. residents and visitors to our nation's capital. I hope, I sincerely hope, that this vote will mark a return to common sense as we work to battle crime in D.C. and around the country. Madam President, I yield the floor.